Hi there and welcome to My Week. I'm Chrissy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining us. We are at the Detroit Historical Museum for a special show devoted to what happened 50 years ago in the summer of 1967. Our coverage coincides with the opening this weekend of an exhibit here at the museum called Detroit 67 Perspectives. We're not just looking back, but we're taking a hard look at where we are now and where we can be 50 years from now when it comes to how we think about race, opportunity, education, and policing in Southeast Michigan. It is a full show with stories from the Detroit Journalism Cooperative and its project over the last year called The Intersection. But let's start first with our MyWeek contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Hi, guys. It's always good to see hey, you. Good to see you. You know, we were upstairs looking at the exhibit, the three of us were, um, and I think it's very interesting that how the exhibit starts with definitions, you know, and, and the, the phrase of really what's in a name, and we've heard it called the riot of 67, the uprising, the rebellion. Why is it so important to define those words or maybe have people have definitions of what, different definitions of what actually happened back in 67? We'll start with you, Nolan. Well, you know, I, I started at the Detroit News nine years um, after 67 and, you know, the riot was what it was called, so that's what I've always called. It became a matter of habit. People in the black community see it from a different perspective. The word's very important to, the, to them in terms of defining what this event was and what it, not necessarily what it was, but what it meant and what it signified, so. What do you think it should yeah, be Yeah, I think you have to, uh, well, I, mean, I, I think it, there's no question it was a rebellion when it started. It was a rebellion against the police brutality that we saw uh, happening against African Americans in the city for a really long time, not just in 1967. It, Developed into a riot, though, which was uh, which was clear on uh, on 12th Street and uh, Dexter and all these other places where people were, you know, smashing up businesses. Some of them, in cases, in some cases, black-owned businesses uh, suffered as well. I think the definition is important because it helps you put it in historical context. It helps you understand that this was not just uh, an event that happened over a few days, but that this this was something that culminated uh, after years and decades of behavior, and it helps us understand how that casts forward uh, 50 years to now. You know, I also think it's interesting, too, in, in figuring out how to cover an anniversary of an event like this and how you, you have to tread and what kind of conversations that you need to have surrounding this, Nolan. Well, they've done a very good job here, I think, of defining the event and its impact and but more importantly why we're still talking about it 50 years later i'd be curious to go to go to the other cities who are who are marking 50 years of disturbances uh this summer because remember that was a a summer filled those two years 67 and 68 of disturbances in major cities across america and i wonder if in other places that event was as seminal as it has been in Detroit. It, it's, it's dominated the conversation during my whole time here. And I, I would say it, we haven't stopped talking about it in 50 years. It was that significant to this city uh, and, it, and its future. It, it's significance in looking back, but also looking at where we are now. But Stephen, what are the pitfalls or what do you have to take in consideration when you, when you cover something like this and looking at 50 years? Well, I think the importance, again, is to put it into context and to say, Here's what happened, here's why it happened, here's what we're dealing with now, and here's why, we're, here's why we're in that situation. Part of it is, after this ends, we don't deal with the things that caused it. Uh, there, there is no real reckoning uh, with the, the issue of police brutality for another six years, even in the public square. Uh, it's a still an issue we, we see around the country today. The deep poverty, the isolation, the disinvestment, those are things that stayed with us a long time after uh, the riots or the rebellion or whatever you want to call it, uh, I think now it's really important to try to, to, try to pull those narratives out of it uh, to be able to talk about what the opportunity is going forward. And it wasn't and, yeah. like it was some great learning experience, some great change. Stress that, uh, that was after, so, yeah. um, so divisive in this town and so so hard on the community. That came after the riots. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna look at some of the recommendations that came out of it 50 years ago and kind of compare where we are today. And to give you a little bit of perspective looking back, the Detroit Journalism Cooperative set out to examine the findings that came out of the uprising of 67. The DJC is made up of six media groups who have joined together to report on Detroit's story. It's us here at Detroit Public TV, also Michigan Radio, WDET, New Michigan Media, Bridge Magazine, and Chalkbeat Detroit. Take a look. We said it couldn't happen, but it did, and the nation was shocked. 
The summer of 1967 saw dozens of uprisings in urban centers across the nation. Detroit's was the worst. I do hereby officially request the immediate deployment of federal troops into Michigan to assist state and local authorities in re-establishing law and order in the city of Detroit. 43 people were killed, most of them black. More than 1,000 other people were injured. 2,500 stores were looted or burned. Nearly 400 families lost their homes. It was just a burst of fire from the top of the building. Before the fires in Detroit were out, President Lyndon Johnson appointed an 11-member Special Advisory Commission on Civil Disorder, known as the Kerner Commission. That commission ultimately blamed the violent outbreaks on federal and state governments ignoring the plight of black residents, on white attitudes toward blacks, and on mainstream media for ignoring the problems and consistently presenting only the white point of view. The report's most quoted conclusion read, our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. This is a battle zone, these are troops, it's like war. Nearly five decades later, the Kerner Report is still considered one of the most insightful documents on race relations and remedies for discrimination to ever be published by the government. It became a best-selling paperback, yet it was largely ignored by President Johnson and Congress. By some measures, black residents in Detroit are in worse shape now than black residents were during the civil rights struggles in the 1960s. Nathaniel Jones served as an assistant counsel on the commission and believes the Kerner Report remains an important way forward. The answers are found in that document, and I think we need to uh, focus as much as we can people's attention on what the findings of that commission were, what the conditions were at the time it was uh, organized and created, and the uh, recommendations that it, that, that it came up with. All right, and joining us now in the discussion are a couple of our partners in the Detroit Journalism Cooperative, Chastity pratt Dawsey from Bridge Magazine and Keith Owens, the senior editor of the Michigan Chronicle. It's good to see both of you, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let well, me we'll just get started in talking about when the DJC said, all right, we're going to take on this project of the intersection and take a look at the Kerner Commission report and pull out some items. Chastity, um, describe what some of those conversations were about how we were going to actually start to tackle that. Oh, it was, it was a lot of voices saying a lot of things all at once. And the Kerner Commission report gave us something to, to frame the discussion because we all are familiar with its recommendations and the fact that a lot of those recommendations were never implemented. And uh, it gave us something to just shape our stories around and uh, to some data points. You know, let's look, let's compare then to now. Uh, it was going to be more than just saying, oh, things were bad then and they're bad now. It really gave us several different issues to tackle, to, uh, you know, collect data on and, and make the comparisons around. And Keith, what were some of those, some of those key issues? Well, housing was one, of course. You know, education we're talking about uh, was as well known back at that time. Uh, redlining was a severe issue in Detroit. And comparing that to now, what is the situation now? Of course, education, you know, you know, Chassie did a lot of, on that. Um, but I would say those and race, obviously, that's one of the main issues that was raised by the Kerner Commission report. Uh, two communities, one white, one black, you know, separate and unequal. So looking in terms of how uh, Detroit is really, um, of course, Detroit was not the only play, uh, city in America that's experienced racism, but of course it was viewed as one of the key, because particularly with the advent of the rebellion, right, in terms of what that meant. And so we examined that in terms of how, what race um, meant then, what it means now, how it defined Detroit, and how it continues to define Detroit. One thing I really want to talk about also is policing, and, and you guys talked about it a little bit before we went to, into that piece and where we are now, and in terms of how the community is reacting with police. And Stephen, I'm going to start with you, and how do you think that we, we have come so far? I, I think there's no question that in Detroit, this is a much different issue today than it was 50 years ago. It's actually a much different issue than it was 15 or 20 years ago when you saw the Free Press uh, unveil a series that, that talked about you know, dragnet investigations, uh, co coercing witnesses, I mean, really awful uh, kinds, of, kinds of behavior. Uh, we've come a long way in Detroit, and that's not to say there aren't still issues between uh, police and, and communities, particularly communities of color. Uh, in the city, but I, I think in general it's fair to say that the police work with the community here in a way that other cities could learn 
from uh, and and sort of make progress. And how do how do departments though though build that kind of trust? Well, I think James um, Craig is a particularly fine example of how it works. He's been very mindful of being in the community, of explaining things to the community, of trying to get out ahead of potential sparks. Um, you know, there are still some some things we ought to be worried about. If you look at the classes coming into the the police academy, they still don't look um, like the city's population. They're they're heavily white still, and I think you you have to always keep in mind the the problems. Problem sixty seven. There were very few black officers, and I think the makeup of the police department does matter and they have to pay some attention to that. Chastity. I, I was just gonna say the same thing. You had 5% of the police force uh, that was black back in 1967 and that it's way different today. And even though the city is majority black, they do see black officers far more often and that makes a difference. And also you gotta remember, we were under federal oversight for a while, so that cleaned right. up a lot of the, the problems that uh, happened within the, the, the police force here in Detroit. Keith, what do you think? Well, I think, I mean, one of the stories we did actually, when you're looking at them, when I spoke with some of the police who were police officers back at that time, a woman who was the first deputy police chief of Coleman Young appointed, and one of the things, when she talks about the experiences that she had uh, working on the, on the desk at night and hearing the white police officers come in and talking about how they had just cracked black kids and laughing at it in front of her, making a point that make sure that she heard that. So I think that at that time, there was a sense the police was an occupying army. It was not a part of the community, it was never intended to be. Um, but now, I think there's not, like I say, once again, we're not where we need to be, but we're definitely not at that position now, so it's definitely made some progress. 